Welcome back, my friends, to the Big Book Podcast. My name is Howard, and I'm an alcoholic. Sober since January 1st, 1988, one day at a time. This is the 59th episode of the Big Book Podcast, and I hope you found this audio version of Alcoholics Anonymous to be both meaningful and enjoyable. In this episode, story number 11, in part one of the stories section of the second edition of the Big Book, published in 1955. It's entitled Home Brewmeister, and was one of only five of the original 29 stories in the first edition to make it into the second edition. Its author, Clarence S., got sober in early 1938. Along with a dozen other sober alcoholics from Cleveland, he would make the 40-mile drive to Akron each week to attend the Oxford Group with Dr. Bob and the other original members of the Akron Group. At that time, a majority of the Cleveland contingent were Catholic. According to Clarence S., when the Roman Catholic Church learned that these men were attending the Protestant-based Oxford group, it threatened excommunication if they continued to attend. Clarence informed Dr. Bob and the members of the yet-to-be-named Akron group that Catholics in the Cleveland group would have to stop coming, which might result in their drinking. The initial reluctance of the Akron group to sever ties with the Oxford group created a rift between the Cleveland and Akron groups. As a result of that rift, Clarence and several others put together their own group in Cleveland in May 1939. They named the group Alcoholics Anonymous, after the title of the newly written Big Book, and modeled it upon the Twelve Steps therein. Some AA historians consider this to be the very first AA group not affiliated with the Oxford group. Along with the Big Book, it soon became the model for groups everywhere. Eventually, the Akron group also split from the Oxford group to focus solely on AA and become an organization that is truly not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Though it may not be referenced in his story, Clarence's personal influence on the AA pillars of inclusiveness and universality have certainly earned him a place among the great early AA pioneers. And now, Part 1, Story 11, Home Brewmeister. An originator of Cleveland's Group No. 3, this one fought prohibition in vain. Strangely enough, I became acquainted with the hilarious life just at the time in my own life when I was beginning really to settle down to a common-sense, sane domesticity. My wife became pregnant, and the doctor recommended the use of port or ale. So I bought a six-gallon crock and a few bottles, listened to advice from amateur brewmeisters, and was off on my beer manufacturing career on a small scale for the time being. Somehow or other, I must have misunderstood the doctor's instructions, for I not only made the beer for my wife, I also drank it for her. As time went on, I found that it was customary to open a few bottles whenever visitors dropped in. That being the case, it didn't take me long to figure out that my meager manufacturing facilities were entirely inadequate to the manufacture of beer for social and domestic consumption. From that point on, I secured crocks of 10-gallon capacity and really took quite an active interest in the manufacture of home brew. We were having card parties with Limburger and beer quite regularly. Eventually, of course, what with all the hilarity that could be provoked with a few gallons of beer, there seemed to be no need of bridge or poker playing for entertainment. The parties waxed more liquid and hilarious as time went on, and eventually I discovered that a little shot of liquor now and then between beers had the tendency to put me in a wacky mood much quicker than having to down several quarts of beer to obtain the same effect. The inevitable result of this discovery was that I soon learned that beer made a very good chaser for whiskey. That discovery so intrigued me that I stayed on that diet almost entirely for the balance of my extensive drinking life. The last day of my drinking career, I drank 22 of them between 10 and 12 a.m., and I shall never know how many more followed them until I was poured into bed that night. I got along fairly well with my party drinking for quite some time, but eventually I began to visit beer joints in between parties. A night or so a week in a joint, and a party or so a week at home or with friends, 
along with a little lone drinking, soon had me preparing for the existence of a top-flight drunkard. Three years after I started on my drinking career, I lost my first job. At that time, I was living out of town, so I moved back to the hometown and made a connection in a responsible position with one of the larger companies in the finance business. Up to this point, I had spent six years in the business and had enjoyed the reputation of being very successful. My new duties were extremely confining, and my liquor consumption began to increase. Upon leaving the office in the evening, my first stop would be a saloon about a block away. However, as there happened to be several saloons within that distance, I didn't find it necessary to patronize the same place each evening. It doesn't pay to be seen in the same place at the same hour every day. The general procedure was to take four or five shots in the first place I stopped at. This would get me feeling fit, and then I would start for home and fireside 13 miles away. On the way home, numerous places must be passed. If I were alone, I would stop at four or five of them, but only one or two in the event I had my mistrusting wife with me. Eventually, I would arrive home for a late supper for which, of course, I had absolutely no relish. I would make a feeble attempt at eating supper, but I never met with any howling success. I never enjoyed any meal, but I ate my lunch at noon for two reasons. First, to help me get out of the fog of the night before, and second, to furnish some measure of nourishment. Eventually, the noon meal was also dispensed with. I cannot remember just when I became the victim of insomnia, but I do know that the last year and a half, I never went to bed sober a single night. I couldn't sleep. I had a mortal fear of going to bed and tossing all night. Evenings at home were an ordeal. As a result, I would fall off in a drunken stupor every night. How I was able to discharge my duties at the office during those horrible mornings, I will never be able to explain. Handling customers, dealers, insurance people, dictation, telephoning, directing new employees, answering to superiors, and all the rest of it. However, it finally caught up with me, and when it did, I was a mental, physical, and nervous wreck. I arrived at the stage where I couldn't quite make it to the office some mornings. Then I would send an excuse of illness. But the firm became violently ill with my drunkenness, and their course of treatment was to remove their ulcer, in the form of me, from the payroll, amid much fanfare and very personal and slighting remarks and insinuations. During this time, I had been threatened, beaten, kissed, praised, and damned alternately by relatives, family, friends, and strangers, but of course it all went for naught. How many times I swore off in the morning and got drunk before sunset, I don't know. I was on the toboggan and really making time. After being fired, I lined up with a new finance company that was just starting in business and took the position of business promotion man, contacting automobile dealers. While working in an office, there was some semblance of restraint, but oh boy, when I got on the outside with this new company without supervision, did I go to town. I really worked for several weeks, and having had a fairly wide acquaintance with the dealer trade, it was not difficult for me to line up enough of them to give me a very substantial volume of business with a minimum of effort. Now I was getting drunk all the time. It wasn't necessary to report to the office in person every day, and when I did go in, it was just to make an appearance and bounce right out again. Finally, this company also became involved, and I was once more looking for a job. Then I learned something else. I learned that a person just can't find a job hanging in a dive or bar room all day and all night, as jobs don't seem to turn up in those places. I became convinced of that because I spent most of my time there and nary a job turned up. By this time, my chances of getting lined up in my chosen business were shot. Everyone had my number and wouldn't hire me at any price. I have omitted details of transgressions that I made when drunk for several reasons. One is that I don't remember too many of them, as I was one of those drunks who could be on his feet and attend a meeting or a party, engage in a conversation with people, and do things that any nearly normal person would do, and the next day not remember a thing about where I was, what I did, whom I saw, or how I got home. That condition was a distinct handicap to me in trying to vindicate myself with a not-so-patient wife. Things eventually came to the point where I had no friends. 
I didn't care to go visiting unless the parties we might visit had plenty of liquor on hand and I could get drunk. Indeed, I was always well on my way before I would undertake to go visiting at all. After holding good positions, making better than an average income for over ten years, I was in debt, had no clothes to speak of, no money, no friends, and no one any longer tolerating me but my wife. My son had absolutely no use for me. Even some of the saloon keepers, where I had spent so much time and money, requested that I stay away from their places. Finally, an old business acquaintance of mine, whom I hadn't seen for several years, offered me a job. I was on that job a month and drunk most of the time. Just at this time, my wife heard of a doctor in another city who had been very successful with drunks. She offered me the alternative of going to see him or her leaving me for good and all. Well, I had a job, and I really wanted desperately to stop drinking, but I couldn't, so I readily agreed to visit the doctor she recommended. That was the turning point of my life. My wife accompanied me on my visit, and the doctor really told me some things that in my state of jitters nearly knocked me out of the chair. He talked about himself, but I was sure it was about me. He mentioned lies and deceptions in the course of his story, in the presence of the one person in the world I wouldn't want to know such things. How did he know all this? I had never seen him before, and at the time hoped I would never see him again. However, he explained to me that he had been just such a rummy as I, only for a much longer period of time. He advised me to enter the particular hospital with which he was connected, and I readily agreed. In all honesty, though, I was skeptical, but I wanted so definitely to quit drinking that I would have welcomed any sort of physical torture or pain to accomplish the result. I made arrangements to enter the hospital three days later and promptly went out and got stiff for three days. It was with grim foreboding and advanced jitters that I checked in at the hospital. Of course, I had no hint or intimation as to what the treatment was to consist of. After being in the hospital for several days, a plan of living was outlined to me, a very simple plan that I still find much joy and happiness in following. It is impossible to put on paper all the benefits I have derived, physical, mental, domestic, spiritual, and monetary. This is no idle talk. It is the truth. From a physical standpoint, I gained 16 pounds in the first two months I was off liquor. I eat three good meals a day now and really enjoy them. I sleep like a baby and never give a thought to such a thing as insomnia. I feel as I did when I was 15 years younger. Mentally, I know where I was last night, the night before and the nights before that. Also, I have no fear of anything. I have self-confidence and assurance that cannot be confused with the cockiness I once possessed. I can think clearly and am helped much in my thinking and judgment by my spiritual development which grows daily. From a domestic standpoint, we really have a home now. I am anxious to get home after dark. My wife is glad to see me come in. My youngster has adopted me. Our home is always full of friends and visitors. No home brew as an inducement. Spiritually, I found a friend who never lets me down and is ever eager to help. I can actually take my problems to him, and he gives me comfort, peace, and happiness. From a monetary standpoint, in the past few years, I have reduced my reckless debts to almost nothing and have had money to get along uncomfortably. I still have my job, and just prior to the writing of this narrative, I received an advancement. For all of these blessings, I thank him. This concludes the reading of Home Brewmeister, from Part 1 of the Personal Stories section of the second edition of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful you listened. Stay tuned for our 60th episode, featuring Story 12, entitled The Keys of the Kingdom. As always, it's super easy to listen to the first and second editions of the Big Book, including many stories not published in later editions. Just visit bigbookpodcast.com and listen to your heart's content, or download and subscribe for free to all of the podcast episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. To listen to earlier chapters and stories in the Big Book, simply scroll down the episode list. If you've enjoyed listening, I'd be super grateful if you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help others find us. 
And please share this podcast with your friends and anyone you know who has a desire to stop drinking. It may be the only version of the big book they ever hear. Thank you.